America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. Today's episode is going to be a review slash uh, an analysis of Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks by Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Last episode, I looked at Greek religion in Walter Burkert's book of that name. And today we will move a little bit from the religion and mythology of ancient Greece into their philosophy. Nietzsche talks about the first of the Greek philosophers in this book, the pre-Socratics. And uh, he wrote this at around the same time that he wrote The Birth of Tragedy. Um, This one, obviously, is much more about philosophy. This is called Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks. So it's these early philosophers not so much talking about tragedy, but um, seemingly this is taking place in the same basic time frame in this sort of pre-philosophical era of mythology and and tragedy and Greek tragedy and drama and things. Um, this was never published in Nietzsche's lifetime. The other book that he wrote around the same time, Birth of Tragedy, was very poorly received uh, by philosophers at the time. But I think... Um, I think it's a really interesting look at ancient Greek philosophy, and it kind of makes it more colorful, which is something I like about this book. Uh, I've read other books about the pre-Socratic philosophers, and at times it can come across as though they're sort of cold and lifeless, Um, you know, with the beginnings of this real analytical metaphysics and stuff that seems more and more disconnected from from day-to-day life. This book presents the early Greek philosophers in a much more colorful light. How accurate his interpretations are, these are not necessarily always the the generally accepted interpretations. It may be the case that he didn't publish this book because of how poor the the reception of his other book was. But this book presents these early Greek philosophers as much more uh, vibrant and maybe taking on some of that vibrancy from the... uh, the, the mythological and um, dramatic aspects of Greek culture. I mean, the, from what I know and understand about the Greeks and like some of the stuff from Edith Hamilton, which I hope to get to at some point, really presents the Greeks in a very sort of colorful and lively, as a colorful and lively people, um, and not this kind of dry clinical approach that can sometimes come through in some of Uh, early Greek philosophy. So anyway, um, I like his presentation here. And I think he does some interesting things. He does kind of look at, in a sort of maybe quasi-mythological analysis of what these early Greeks are saying. There's, I want to say, uh, six sections in here that I want to read out loud. The first few sections I want to read, he's talking about philosophy. Um, and then, so that's, that's the only part where he's more kind of taking this sort of external view. And then he dives into the philosophers themselves. He talks about Anaximander, um, Heraclitus, and he talks about some others, Parmenides. The sort of, there's a sort of dichotomy between Heraclitus and Parmenides, uh, I believe, that Nietzsche really draws to the fore in this book, um, and his commentary on some of the other philosophers doesn't, I don't think, just really rises to the level of importance as this this um, dichotomy between these these two philosophers. So, anyway, let me let me just jump in. I'll read to you this first section about philosophy itself. This is about philosophy as potentially dangerous, a potentially dangerous endeavor. Um, of course, also potentially very fruitful. But it's interesting how he sets this up. So he says, quote, There are people who are opposed to all philosophy, and one does well to listen to them, particularly when they advise the diseased minds of Germans to stay away from metaphysics, instead preaching purification through physis, as Goethe did, or healing through music, as did Richard Wagner. 
the physicians of our culture repudiate philosophy. Whoever wishes to justify it must show, therefore, to what ends a healthy culture uses and has used philosophy. Perhaps the sick will then actually gain salutary insight into why philosophy is harmful specifically to them. There are good instances, to be sure, of a type of health which can exist altogether without philosophy, or with but a very moderate, almost playful exercise of it. The Romans, during their best period, lived without philosophy. But where could we find an instance of cultural pathology which philosophy restored to health? If philosophy ever manifested itself as helpful, redeeming, or prophylactic, it was in a healthy culture. The sick, it made even sicker. Wherever a culture was disintegrating, wherever the tension between it and its individual components was slack, philosophy could never reintegrate the individuals back into the group. Wherever an individual was of a mind to stand apart, to draw a circle of self-sufficiency about himself, philosophy was ready to isolate him still further, finally to destroy him through that isolation. Philosophy is dangerous, wherever it does not exist in its fullest right, and it is only the health of a culture, and not every culture at that, which accords it such fullest right. And now let us look around for the highest authority for what we may term cultural health. The Greeks, with their truly healthy culture, have once and for all justified philosophy simply by having engaged in it and engaged in it more fully than any other people. They could not even stop engaging in philosophy at the proper time. Even in their skinny old age, they retained the hectic postures of ancient suitors, even when all they meant by philosophy was but the pious sophistries and the sacrosanct hair-splittings of Christian dogmatics. By the fact that they were unable to stop in time, they considerably diminished their merit for barbaric posterity, because this posterity in the ignorance and unrestraint of its youth, was bound to get caught in those two artfully woven nets and ropes. On the other hand, the Greeks knew precisely how to begin at the proper time, and the lesson of how one must start out in philosophy they demonstrate more plainly than any other people. Not to wait until a period of affliction, as those who derive philosophy from personal moroseness imagine, but to begin in the midst of good fortune, at the peak of mature manhood, as a pursuit springing from the ardent joyousness of courageous and victorious maturity. At such a period of their culture, the Greeks engaged in philosophy, and this teaches us not only what philosophy is and does, but also gives us information about the Greeks themselves. For if they had been the sober and precocious technicians and the cheerful sensates, that the learned Philistines of our day imagine they were, or if they had floated solely in a self-indulgent fog, reverberating with heavy feet, heavy breathings and deep feelings, as the unscholarly fantists among us like to assume, the wellspring of philosophy should never have seen the light of day in Greece. At most, it would have produced a rivulet, soon to lose itself in the sands or evaporate in a haze, it never could have become that broad, proud stream which we know as Greek philosophy. And he then, later in the next page, he goes on to say, Nothing would be sillier than to claim an autochthonous development for the Greeks. On the contrary, they invariably absorbed other living cultures. The very reason they got so far is that they knew how to pick up the spear and throw it onward from the point where others had left it. Their skill in the art of fruitful learning was admirable. We ought to be learning from our neighbors precisely as the Greeks learned from theirs. Not for the sake of learned pedantry, but rather using everything we learn as a foothold, which will take us up as high and higher than our neighbor. The quest for philosophy's beginnings is idle, for everywhere, in all beginnings, we find only the crude, the unformed, the empty, and the ugly. What matters in all things is the higher levels. People who prefer to spend their time on Egyptian or Persian philosophy rather than on Greek on the grounds that the former are more original and, in any event, older, are just as ill-advised as those who cannot deal 
with the magnificent, profound mythology of the Greeks until they have reduced it to the physical trivialities of sun, lightning, storm, and mist, which originally, presumably, gave rise to it. They are the people, also, who imagine they have found a purer form of religion than that of Greek polytheism when they discover the good old Aryans restricting their worship to the single vault of heaven. Everywhere, the way to the beginnings leads to barbarism. Whoever concerns himself with the Greeks should be ever mindful that an unrestrained thirst for knowledge, for its own sake, barbarizes men, just as much as hatred of knowledge. The Greeks themselves, possessed of an inherently insatiable thirst for knowledge, controlled it by their ideal need for and consideration of all the values of life. Whatever they learned, they wanted to live through immediately. They engaged in philosophy, as in everything else, as civilized human beings, and with highly civilized aims, wherefore, free of any kind of autochthonous conceit, they forebode trying to reinvent the elements of philosophy and science. Rather, they instantly tackled the job of so fulfilling, enhancing, elevating, and purifying the elements they took over from elsewhere that they became inventors after all, but in a higher sense and in a purer sphere. For what they invented was the archetypes of philosophic thought. All posterity has not made an essential contribution to them since then. All other cultures are put to shame by the marvelously idealized philosophical company represented by the ancient Greek masters Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Democritus, and Socrates. These men are monolithic. Their thinking and their character stand in a relation characterized by strictest necessity. They are devoid of conventionality, for in their day there was no philosophic or academic professionalism. All of them, in magnificent solitude, were the only ones of their time whose lives were devoted to insight alone. They all possessed that virtuous energy of the ancients, herein excelling all men since, which led them to find their own individual form and to develop it through all its metamorphoses to its subtlest and greatest possibilities, for there was no convention to meet them halfway. Thus, all of them together form what Schopenhauer, in contrast to the Republic of Scholars, has called the Republic of Creative Minds, each giant calling to his brother through the desolate intervals of time, and undisturbed by the wanton noises of the dwarfs that creep past beneath them, their high spirit converse continues. End quote. So I think that's a really awesome uh, introduction. That's the very beginning of the book, um, you know, absent the, the preface. And uh, he talks about how philosophy is only valuable, it's only useful to a healthy society. And to an unhealthy society, it can actually degrade them even further. Uh, it isolates people and drives their isolation even greater. And he also talks about how knowledge for knowledge's sake alone is a form of barbarism just as much as uh, aversion to knowledge. Because knowledge, according to the Greeks, was should be tempered by values. He talks about the Greeks as being the healthiest of civilizations and at the peak of their health, at the peak of their uh, maturity and, and, and strength and nobility was when they began to engage in the creation of what he calls the archetypes of philosophy, the archetypes of philosophic thought. They engaged in philosophy as civilized human beings, he says, and with highly civilized aims. But he says they didn't necessarily invent the most rudimentary aspects of philosophy, that they borrowed it from other cultures, such as the Persians and the Egyptians, and they picked up where these other cultures had left off and carried it further. And he, he basically says that it reached its peak, philosophy reached its peak in the ancient Greeks, and I think specifically it seems as though he believes that even Socrates himself was the beginning of the degradation of philosophy. They can get that sort of thing from uh, from the other book, Birth of Tragedy, and he doesn't really get to Socrates in this book, 
Um, he only deals with the earliest philosophers, maybe somewhere toward the end uh, he might mention him, but he's not talking about Socrates in this book. He's talking about the earliest philosophers. So I think that's really an interesting perspective. Um, it really says, sort of saying that all of philosophy since the earliest Greeks, since what we would kind of understand as like the beginning of philosophy, but he seems to say that all philosophy from then has been a sort of degradation. Um, and if you think about the idea of what uh, I believe is Alfred North Whitehead said about philosophy being a series of footnotes to Plato, who sort of backed that up that philosophy hasn't really generated the new thoughts that animated uh, the earliest philosophers. And even Plato himself is in, in some ways responding well, he's responding to Socrates, obviously, as Socrates' a student, uh, but also to Heraclitus and Parmenides. Plato talks about these other philosophers and how Socrates would respond to them and putting his own words in Socrates' mouth, how he responds to Heraclitus and Parmenides and these other earliest of philosophers, uh, who I think that Plato maybe calls sophists, perhaps prematurely. Uh, but this, I'm not talking about Plato. Let's move this right along. So he also, this other section that I want to read, this is a, a more brief section um, before I get into the, the actual philosophers. He talks a little bit about liberal education. And he says, quote, a period which suffers from a so-called high general level of liberal education but which is devoid of culture in the sense of a unity of style, which characterizes all its life, will not quite know what to do with philosophy, and wouldn't if the genius of truth himself were to proclaim it in the streets and the marketplaces. During such times, philosophy remains the learned monologue of the lonely stroller, the accidental loot of the individual, the secret skeleton in the closet, or the harmless chatter, between senile academics and children. No one may venture to fulfill philosophy's law with his own person. No one may live philosophically with that simple loyalty which compelled an ancient, no matter where he was or what he was doing, to deport himself as a Stoic if he once had pledged faith to the Stoa. All modern philosophizing is political, policed by governments, churches, academies, custom, fashion, and human cowardice, all of which limit it to a fake learnedness. Our philosophy stops with the sigh, if only, and with the insight, once upon a time. Philosophy has no rights, and modern man, if he had any courage or conscience, should really repudiate it. He might ban it, with words similar to those which Plato used to ban the tragic poets from his state. Though reply could be made, just as the tragic poets might have made reply to Plato. If forced, for once, to speak out, philosophy might readily say, Wretched people, is it my fault if I am roaming the country among you like a cheap fortune teller? If I must hide and disguise myself as though I were a fallen woman and you my judges? Just look at my sister, Art. Like me, she is in exile among barbarians. We no longer know what to do to save ourselves. True, here among you we have lost all our rights, but the judges who shall restore them to us shall judge you too. And to you they shall say, Go get yourselves a culture. Only then will you find out what philosophy can and will do. End quote. So I love that section. He talks about a culture which suffers, the very beginning line here, he says, a period which suffers from a so-called high general level of liberal education, but which is devoid of culture, in the sense of a unity of style, which characterizes all its life, will not quite know what to do with philosophy. When we are all atomized, separated, isolated into separate people, separate groups, without any sort of unifying culture, without any strong sense of identity that runs through everyone instinctively, 
not something adopted, worn like a costume, but an instinctive, fundamental culture from which we're bound by birth. Without that, you can't have philosophy because you only have separate little people, the, the wandering stroller, or what is it he says, the, the learned monologue of the lonely stroller, the accidental loot of the individual, the harmless chatter between senile academics and children. You can't have true lived philosophy like a Stoic is a Stoic every moment of, of his day because he pledged himself to the Stoa. In a liberal society that isn't even comprehensible. And I love when he has philosophy speak for itself at the end there. Philosophy is saying, Wretched people, is it my fault if I am roaming the country among you like a cheap fortune teller, if I must hide and disguise myself, as though I were a fallen woman and you my judges? Just look at my sister, Art. Like me, she is an exile among barbarians. We no longer know what to do with ourselves. True, here among you we have lost all our rights, but the judges who shall restore them to us shall judge you too, and they shall to you they shall say, go get yourselves a culture, and only then will you find out what philosophy can and will do. Anyway, that's awesome. I think that's awesome. Let me move on. So yeah, he moves through the philosophers, the early philosophers, chronologically, each one responding to the previous, and he opens it up, not with Thales. Actually, no, he does open it up with Thales. My, uh, I'm sorry, he does. I don't want to talk about Thales, though. I think Thales doesn't isn't really the the truest beginning or the beginning that i find the most compelling which is anaximander so in this section when he's talking about anaximander he says quote it may not be logical but it certainly is human to view together with anaximander all coming to be as though it were an illegitimate emancipation from eternal being a wrong for which destruction is the only penance. Everything that has ever come to be again passes away, whether we think of human life or of water or of hot and cold. Wherever definite qualities are perceivable, we can prophesy upon the basis of enormously extensive experience the passing away of those qualities. Never, in other words, can a being which possesses definite qualities or consists of such be the origin or first principle of things. That which truly is, concludes Anaximander, cannot possess the definite characteristics, or it would come to be and pass away, like all the other things. In order that coming to be shall not cease, primal being must be indefinite. The immortality and everlastingness of primal being does not lie in its infinitude or its inexhaustibility, as the commentators of Anaximander generally assume, but in the fact that it is devoid of definite qualities that would lead to its passing, hence its name the indefinite. Thus named, the primal being is superior to that which comes to be, ensuring thereby eternity and the unimpeded course of coming to be. This ultimate unity of the indefinite, the womb of all things, can, it is true, be designated by human speech only as a negative as something to which the, the existent world of coming to be can give no predicate. We may look upon it as the equal of the Kantian thing as such. Now, anyone who can quarrel as to what sort of primal stuff this could have been, whether an intermediate substance between air and water, or perhaps between air and fire, has certainly not understood our philosopher at all. This is equally true of those who ask themselves seriously whether Anaximander thought of his primal substance as perhaps a mixture of all existent materials. Instead, we must direct our glance to that lapidary sentence which we cited earlier, to the place where we may learn that Anaximander was no longer dealing with the question of the origin of this world in a purely physical way. Rather, when he saw in the multiplicity of things that have come to be, a sum of injustices that must be expiated. He grasped with bold fingers the tangle of the profoundest problem in ethics. He was the first Greek to do so. How can anything pass away which has a right to be? Whence that restless, ceaseless coming into being and giving birth? Whence that grimace of painful disfiguration on the continents of nature? Whence the never-ending dirge in all the realms of existence? From this world of injustice, 
of insolent apostasy from the primeval oneness of all things, Anaximander flees into a metaphysical fortress from which he leans out, letting his gaze sweep the horizon. At last, after long pensive silence, he puts a question to all creatures. What is your existence worth? And, if it is worthless, why are you here? Your guilt, I see, causes you to tarry in your existence. With your death, you have to expiate it. Look how your earth is withering, how your seas are diminishing and drying up. The seashell on the mountaintop can show you how much has dried up already. Even now, fire is destroying your world. Some day it will go up in fumes and smoke. But ever and anew, another such world of ephemerality will construct itself. Who is there that could redeem you from the curse of coming to be? And then <clears throat> later on, the next page, uh, he goes on to say, quote, Anaximander asks himself, how is the many possible if there is such a thing as the eternal one? And he takes his answer from the self-contradictory, self-consuming, and negating character of the many. Its existence becomes for him a moral phenomenon. It is not justified, but expiates itself forever through its passing. But then he sees another question. Why hasn't all that came to be passed away long since, since a whole eternity of time has passed? Whence the ever-renewed stream of coming to be? And from this question he can save himself only by a mystic possibility. Eternal coming to be can have its origin only in eternal being, the conditions for the fall from being to coming to be in injustice are forever the same. The constellation of things is such that no end can be envisaged for the emergence of individual creatures from the womb of the indefinite. Here, Anaximander stopped, which means he remained in the deep shadows, which lie like gigantic ghosts upon the mountains of this worldview. The closer men wanted to get to the problem of how the definite could ever fall from the indefinite, the ephemeral from the eternal, the unjust from the just, the deeper grew the night. So that is Anaximander, and he's saying, he's asking, how is it that things come to be? How is it that a thing that is doesn't have a right to continue to exist, that a thing that is passes away? All things which are pass away. Everything eventually dissipates or disappears. The patterns of things, the fact that all people die, all things, you know, our earth is going to sink into the sun. Obviously, Anaximander didn't know that the world is going to fall into the sun, but the point is, all things that are pass away in time. And yet, new things are continually coming to be. How is it that anything that is should deserve to no longer be, or how a thing that isn't should deserve to be. And he puts in a sort of ethical question about into it there, um, which is just very interesting. And the only explanation is that he comes up with is that there is some sort of source which is indefinite. It has no quality that could that could pass away. There's nothing about it that can be said, um, because to say anything about it is to give it a quality, and all qualities fade. And this, this endless, indefinite source of all things uh, is, is just and right, I guess, in his interpretation. Uh, he, he, I mean, he describes it as a falling, falling from, uh, you know, he, he says the last sentence. Well, let me read the last several sentences. Eternal coming to be can have its origin only in eternal being. The conditions for the fall from being to coming to be in injustice are forever the same. The constellation of things is such that no end can be envisaged for the emergence of individual creatures from the womb of indefinite. Here Anaximander stopped, which means he remained in the deep shadows, which lie like gigantic ghosts upon the mountains of this worldview. The closer men wanted to get to the problem of how the definite could ever fall from the indefinite, the ephemeral from the eternal, the unjust from the just, the deeper grew the night. A sort of impossibility of the connection between the eternal 
indefinite oneness and the many things that come to be and pass away. But there's a moral section. He, he, he describes this as the unjust descending from the just. The, uh, the, the de definite could ever fall from the indefinite. So there's a hierarchy here. The source is higher, greater, and more just than all the things which uh, are sprung forth from it. So that's Anaximander. Let's move on to Heraclitus. He says, quote, Straight at that mystic night, in which was shrouded Anaximander's problem of becoming, walked Heraclitus of Ephesus and illuminated it by a divine stroke of lightning. Becoming is what I contemplate, he exclaims, and no one else has watched so attentively this everlasting wavebeat and rhythm of things. And what did I see? Lawful order, unfailing certainties, ever like orbits of lawfulness, Arrhenius sitting in judgment on all transgressions against lawful order, the whole world the spectacle of sovereign justice and of the demonically ever-present natural forces that serve it. Not the punishment of what has come to be, did I see, but the justification of that which is coming into being. When did hubris, when did apostasy ever reveal itself in inviolable forms, in laws held sacred, where injustice rules, there are caprice, disorder, lawlessness, contradiction. But where law and Zeus's daughter D.K. rule alone, as they do in this world, how could there be the sphere of guilt, of penance, of judgment? How could this world be the execution arena of all that is condemned? From such intuition, Heraclitus derived two connected negations. Only through comparison with the doctrines of his predecessor can they be illuminated. 1. He denied the duality of totally diverse worlds, a position which Anaximander had been compelled to assume. He no longer distinguished a physical world from a metaphysical one, a realm of definite qualities from an undefinable indefinite, and after this first step nothing could hold him back from a second, far bolder negation. He altogether denied being. For this one world which he retained, supported by eternal unwritten laws, flowing upward and downward in a brazen rhythmic beat, nowhere shows a tarrying, an indestructibility, a bulwark in the stream. Louder than Anaximander, Heraclitus proclaimed, I see nothing other than becoming. Be not deceived. It is the fault of your myopia, not of the nature of things, if you believe you see land somewhere in the ocean of coming to be and passing away. You use names for things as though they rigidly, persistently endured, yet even the stream into which you step a second time is not the one you stepped in before. End quote. And so I like what he, he, he closes that section, uh, that paragraph at least. He goes on to talk about Heraclitus more, um, and I'm going to read another section from his conversation about Heraclitus. Um, but he ends that with that that famous phrase, you can't step in the same river twice, which is attributed to Heraclitus, or some form of that phrase is attributed to Heraclitus. And he's basically saying, Heraclitus comes along and says, what being? All I see is becoming. All I see are things coming to be and passing away, and coming to be and passing away. Why must there be postulated this sort of duality between being and becoming, between definite and indefinite? He doesn't see any evidence for this indefinite source, this eternal indefinite source of all things which are springing forth, all just continually, he sees just continual changes in state, and every state is a new thing which has arisen. The river you step in now is a thing, right? But then you step in it again, it's not the same river, it's changed, the waters move, the shape has changed, the waves are different, but it's a new thing, the new river. But that river is only lasts for an instant. All the things are patterns of things and it's all becoming and changing all the way down. He says everything is becoming and there is no being. So that's Heraclitus' response to Anaximander. And then the, the other section I want to read from his conversation about Heraclitus is when he talks about conflict as a source of growth and of existence. Uh, he talks about a couple of Greek concepts, Eris and Aegon. Eris... Um, is strife and Aegon is uh, 
not strife, but contest, struggle, but with less of the destructive sense of Eris, strife. Um, Eris is, is, uh, is understood as a goddess and is actually could be considered the source of the entire Trojan War as a goddess, the goddess who rolled in the golden apple into the party. Um, Aegon is generally not really considered a god. Uh, but I wonder if maybe in some circumstances it was. Uh, you know, we don't know the entirety of it, but I think that it's an interesting idea to think of Aegon as, as a deity or manifestation of, of struggle. Anyhow, let me jump in here. He says, quote, the everlasting and exclusive coming to be. The impermanence of anything actual, which constantly acts and comes to be, but never is, as Heraclitus teaches it, is a terrible, paralyzing thought. Its impact on man can most nearly be likened to the sensation during an earthquake, when one loses one's familiar confidence in a firmly grounded earth. It takes astonishing strength to transform this reaction into its opposite, into sublimity and the feeling of blessed astonishment. Heraclitus achieved this by means of an observation regarding the actual process of all coming to be and passing away. He conceived it under the form of polarity, as being the diverging of a force into two qualitatively different opposed activities that seek to reunite. Everlastingly, a given quality contends against itself and separates into opposites. Everlastingly, these opposites seek to reunite. Ordinary people fancy that they see something rigid, complete, and permanent. In truth, however, light and dark, bitter and sweet, are attached to each other and interlocked at any given moment, like wrestlers, of whom sometimes the one, sometimes the other, is on top. Honey, says Heraclitus, is at the same time mixing, bitter and sweet. The world itself is a mixed drink which must constantly be stirred. The strife of the opposites gives birth to all that comes to be. The definite qualities, which look permanent to us, express but the momentary ascendancy of one partner. But this by no means signifies the end of the war. The contest endures in all eternity. Everything that happens, happens in accordance with this strife, and it is just in the strife that eternal justice is revealed. It is a wonderful idea, welling up from the purest strings of Hellenism, the idea that strife embodies the everlasting sovereignty of strict justice bound to everlasting laws. Only a Greek was capable of finding such an idea to be the fundament of a cosmology. It is Hesiod's good Eris transformed into the cosmic principle. It is the contest idea of the Greek individual and the Greek state taken from the gymnasium and the palestra, from the artist's Aegon, from the contest between political parties and between cities, all transformed into universal application, so that now the wheels of the cosmos turn on it. Just as the Greek individual fought as though he alone were right, and an infinitely sure measure of judicial opinion were determining the trend of victory at any given moment, so the qualities wrestle with one another, in accordance with inviolable laws and standards that are imminent in the struggle. The things, in whose definiteness and endurance narrow human minds, like animal minds, believe, have no real existence. They are but the flash and spark of drawn swords, the quick radiance of victory in the struggle of opposites. End quote. So that's, I think, real cool. He's talking about this constant struggle or conflict between opposing forces uh, that create the nature of existence. Things breaking apart, being broken apart, seeking to reunite with one another. Um, and I think that in some sense, he, he, he almost postulates this struggle as eternal. In, in which case, that would maybe break away from the notion that everything is temporary. Um, but at that point, he's sort of talking about the laws of reality, that this struggle is the law of reality. And, and so while things may come and go, there's some sort of deeper law that organizes the mechanisms by which things come and go. And so the struggle itself is eternal. And in that way, struggle or strife is 
maybe moves toward godhood uh, or divinity in the mind of the early Greek. It's an interesting idea. So now the last section that I want to read is when he discusses Parmenides. Parmenides responding directly to Heraclitus, at least in, the, in Nietzsche's interpretation. And I think very, a very interesting perspective. So he says, quote, While each word of Heraclitus expresses the pride and the majesty of truth, but of truth grasped in intuitions rather than attained by the rope ladder of logic, while in Sibylline rapture Heraclitus gazes but does not peer, knows but does not calculate, his contemporary Parmenides stands beside him as a counter-image, likewise expressing a type of truth-teller, but one formed of ice rather than fire, pouring cold, piercing light all around. And then on the next page he goes on to say, quote, Parmenides, whose personal acquaintance with Anaximander does not seem unbelievable to me, and whose starting position from Anaximander's doctrines is not merely credible but evident, has the same distrust toward a total separation of a world which only is, and a world which only comes to be, that Heraclitus too had seized upon and which led him to the denial of all being. Both men sought a way out of the contradictoriness and disparateness of a double world order. The leap into the indefinite undefinable, by which Anaximander had once and for all escaped the realm of come to be and its empirically given qualities, did not come easy to minds as independent as those of Heraclitus and Parmenides. They sought to stay on their feet as long as they could, preserving their leap for the spot where the foot no longer finds support, and one must jump to keep from falling. Both of them looked repeatedly at just that world which Anaximander had condemned with such melancholy and had declared as the place of wickedness and simultaneously of atonement for the unjustness of all coming to be. Gazing at this world, Heraclitus, as we have seen, discovered what wonderful order, regularity, and certainty manifested themselves in all coming to be. From this he concluded that coming to be itself could not be anything evil or unjust. His look was oriented from a point of view totally different from that of Parmenides. The latter compared the qualities and believed that he found them not equal but divided into two rubrics. Comparing, for example, light and dark, he found the latter obviously but the negation of the former. Thus he differentiated between positive and negative qualities, seriously attempting to find and note this basic contradictory principle throughout all nature. His method was as follows. He took several contradictories, light and heavy, for example, rare and dense, active and passive, and held them against his original model contradictories, light and dark. Whatever corresponded to light was the positive quality, whatever corresponded to dark, the negative. Taking heavy and light, for example, light, in the sense of weightlessness, was apportioned to light, heavy to dark, and thus heavy seemed to him but the negation of weightlessness. But weightlessness seemed a positive quality. The very method exhibits a defiant talent for abstract logical procedure, closed against all influences of sensation. For heaviness surely seems to urge itself upon the senses as a positive quality. Yet this did not prevent Parmenides from labeling it as a negation. Likewise, he designated earth as against fire, cold as against warm, dense as against rare, feminine as against masculine, and passive as against active to be negatives. Thus, before his gaze, our empirical world divided into two separate spheres. The one, characterized by light, fieriness, warmth, weightlessness, rarefication, activity, and masculinity. The other by the opposite negative qualities. The latter really express only the lack, the absence of the former positive ones. Thus, he described the sphere which lacks the positive qualities as dark, earthy, cold, heavy, dense, and feminine passive in general. Instead of the words positive and negative, he used the absolute terms existent and non-existent. Now he had arrived at the principle, Anaximander notwithstanding, that this world of ours contains something which is existent as well as something which is non-existent. 
the existent should therefore not be sought outside the world and beyond our horizon. Right here before us, everywhere, in all coming to be, there is contained an active something which is existent. But now, he was left with the task of formulating a more exact answer to the question, what is coming to be? And this was the moment when he had to leap to keep from falling. Although for natures such as Permenides, perhaps all leaping constitutes a kind of falling. Suffice it to say that we shall enter the fog, the mysticism of qual occult qualities, and even, just a little, the realm of mythology. Parmenides, like Heraclitus, gazes at universal coming to be and at impermanence, and he can interpret passing away only as though it were a fault of non-existence. For how could the existent be guilty of passing away? But coming to be, too, must be produced with the help of the non-existent, for the existent is always there. Of and by itself, it could not come to be, nor could it explain coming to be. Hence, coming to be, as well as passing away, would seem to be produced by the negative qualities. But since that which comes to be has a content which is lost in the process of passing away, it presupposes that the positive qualities, for they are the essence of such content, likewise participate in both processes of change. In brief, we now have the dictum that, for coming to be, the existent as well as the non-existent are necessary. Whenever they interact, we have coming to be. But how are the positive and the negative to get together? Should they not forever flee each other as contradictories, and thus making all coming to be impossible? Here, Parmenides appeals to an occult quality, to the mystic tendency of opposites, to attract and unite, and he symbolizes the opposition in the name of Aphrodite, in the empirically well-known relationship between masculinity and femininity. It is the power of Aphrodite that weds the opposites, the existent with the non-existent. Desire unites the contradictory and mutually repellent elements. The result is coming to be. When desire is satiated, hatred and inner opposition drives the existent and the non-existent apart once more, and man says, all things pass. End quote. So in this, in this section, I'll read a little bit more about Parmenides. Uh, he says, he says, quote, On a certain day and in a certain frame of mind, Parmenides tested his two interactive contradictories, whose mutual desire and hatred constitute the world and all coming to be. He tested the existent and the non-existent, the positive and negative properties, and suddenly he found that he could not get past the concept of a negative quality, the concept of non-existence. Could something which is not be a quality? Or more basically, can something which is not be? For the only single form of knowledge which we trust immediately and absolutely, and to deny which amounts to insanity, is the tautology A equals A. But just this tautological insight proclaims inexorably, what is not, is not, what is, is. And suddenly Parmenides felt a monstrous logical sin burdening his whole previous life. Had he not lightheartedly always assumed that there are such things as negative qualities, non-existent entities, that in other words, A is not A. But only total perversity of thinking could have done so. To be sure, he reflected, the great mass of people had always made the same perverse judgment. He had merely participated in a universal crime against logic. But the same moment that shows him his crime illuminates him with a glorious discovery. He has found a principle, a key to the cosmic secret, remote from all human illusion. Now, grasping the firm and awful hand of tautological truth about being, he can climb down into the abyss of all things. And then the next page, uh, a bit later, he says, quote, And then he really dipped into the cold bath of his awe-inspiring abstractions. That which truly is must be forever present. You cannot say of it, it was, it will be. The existent cannot have come to be, for out of what could it have come? Out of the non-existent? But the non-existent is not, and cannot produce anything. Out of the existent? This would reproduce nothing but itself. It is the same with passing away. Passing away is just as impossible as coming to be. 
as is all change, all decrease, all increase. In fact, the only valid proposition that can be stated is everything of which you can say it has been or it will be is not. Of the existent, you can never say it is not. The existent is indivisible. For where is the second power that could divide it? It is immobile, for where could it move to? It can be neither infinitely large nor infinitely small, for it is perfect, and a perfect given infinity is a contradiction. Thus it hovers, bounded, finished, immobile, everywhere in balance, equally perfect at each point, like a globe, though not in space, for this space would be a second existent. But there cannot be several existents, for in order to separate them, there would have to be something which is not existent, a supposition which cancels itself. Thus, there is only eternal unity. And now, whenever Parmenides glances backward at the world of coming to be, the world whose existence he used to try to comprehend by means of ingenious conjectures, he becomes angry with his eyes for so much as seeing coming to be, with his ears for hearing it. Whatever you do, do not be guided by your dull eyes, is now his imperative, nor by your resounding ears, nor by your tongue, but test all things with the power of your thinking alone. Thus he accomplished the immensely significant first critique of man's apparatus of knowledge, a critique as yet inadequate but doomed to bear dire consequences. By wrenching apart the senses and the capacity for abstraction. In other words, by splitting up mind as though it were composed of two quite separate capacities, he demolished intellect itself, encouraging man to indulge in that wholly erroneous distinction between spirit and body, which, especially since Plato, lies upon philosophy like a curse. All sense perceptions, says Parmenides, yield but illusions, and their main illusoriness lies in their pretense that the non-existent coexists with the existent, that becoming, too, has being. All the manifold, colorful world known to experience, all the transformations of its qualities, all the orderliness of its ups and downs are cast aside mercilessly as mere semblance and illusion. Nothing may be learned from them. All effort spent upon this false, deceitful world, which is futile and negligible, faked into a lying existence by the senses, is therefore wasted. When one makes as total judgment, as does Parmenides, about the whole of the world, one ceases to be a scientist, an investigator, into any of the world's parts. One's sympathy toward phenomena atrophies. One even develops a hatred for phenomena, including oneself, a hatred for being unable to get rid of the everlasting deceitfulness of sensation. Henceforward, truth shall live only in the palest, most abstracted generalities, in the empty husks of the most indefinite terms, as though in a house of cobwebs. And beside such truth now sits our philosopher, likewise as bloodless as his abstractions, in the spun-out fabric of his formulas. A spider, at least, wants blood from its victims. The Parmenidean philosopher hates most of all the blood of his victims, the blood of the empirical reality which was sacrificed and shed by him. End quote. So I think that's phenomenal. It's kind of like a condemnation of Parmenides, and yet he really sort of makes the argument that Parmenides is really not that far off because the arguments sound, at least on somewhat layman's reading of this kind of to make sense. And I think that that's kind of an interesting perspective when you say what, you know, when you're talking about what is, what exists, if you were to step outside of time, for example, and look at the universe as a whole from its, you know, from all of its dimensions, it's, you know, it's three-dimensional space, but also it's fourth dimensional entirety from its its beginning to its end in the dimension of time, in in other words, seeing the universe in its entirety, uh, once you step outside of the time, the 
separation between one moment to the next, then becoming, coming to be and passing away are meaningless. Not meaningless, but they're simply qualities of the whole. So in a sense, if you could get outside of the universe it would all, and outside of time, it would all just be. But we're bound inside here and we can never ascertain or reach that sort of ultimate being. And so in that sense, we're, we're stuck inside of a sort of illusion. And I think that's kind of what Parmenides is saying. All of this coming to be, all of this passing away, uh, these things don't exist and then cease to exist. The past and the present and the future all exist equally. We just can't, we just can't see it that way because we can't step outside of the illusion. How can what exists come from what is not? How can things arise and then cease to be? They come from non-existence into existence? How can that be? How can non-existence produce things? It's an interesting argument, and I think it has some validity when one steps out of the boundaries imposed upon us by time. So that's all there is in that. Again, he talks about some um, other uh, Anaxagoras, Democritus, but I want to close it out with Parmenides. Her Heraclitus and Parmenides, sort of one seeing this incomprehensibility of the duality between being and becoming one negates being, and the other one negates becoming. And he says one is like fire. Heraclitus is like fire, constantly changing, and Parmenides is like ice. Everything frozen. I find that very, a very interesting way of viewing those two philosophers. So, um, that's all for now. Thanks for listening. Bye.